Well, good evening uh, once more and welcome back again to um, Grace Baptist Church in Perth this Sunday evening. Thank you for joining with us and um, we do pray that this time that we will spend together, the next 40 minutes or 45 minutes or so, again will be a blessing to you uh, this evening. And these are strange times that we are living in um, and they seem to get stranger almost every day with the reports that we read on in our newspapers, on the internet or we watch on the television. Uh, things seem to get stranger and stranger and we don't know when things will get back to normal if they will ever get back to normal we do pray that they will and we pray that one day very soon that we will all be able to meet together once more as congregations in our places of worship wherever that may be up and down this land and what a great day that will be when we will actually be able to meet together in the same room and praise and worship god uh, we look forward to that this certainly we do indeed um, <clears throat> this evening we're going to continue on with our series in the book of Ezra and um, we're coming to Ezra chapter 1 uh, this evening and after we've finished um, this evening we're, we're hoping to have um, a couple of items of worship uh, this evening one by the Gettys, Power of the Cross and again another one uh, by City of Light, uh, The Goodness of Jesus so again after I've finished preaching stay on screen and you'll be able to join in these two portions of worship the words will come up again you'll be able to sing along that is something i didn't think i would ever say i think i would ever say that i miss singing um i'm not a great singer i never have been uh, my dad is a great singer my sister has got that gift but i've got the gift from my mother and the pair of us don't really are not able to hold a tune but it will be great again uh, very soon hopefully to be able to come together and sing and worship uh, true praises to our God so this is the best that we have at the moment so stay with us after I finish preaching and join together um, in singing these two wonderful pieces of worship before we come to the the preaching of God's word again if we can just come and bow before the Lord this evening and ask for his help as we come round his word let us bow our heads our heavenly father once more we we give you praise, we give you thanks that we are found uh, here today. We thank you, Lord, that maybe it may not be a building where we can all meet together, but Heavenly Father, we're here together to worship you. And we thank you that we are found here this evening to do that. Oh, Heavenly Father, so often we take for granted our churches, don't we? We've taken for granted our church buildings and, and meeting together and the fellowship that we have together and the, the talking and the the camaraderie that we have had together oh but heavenly father i don't think we'll ever forget forget that ever again because lord we miss it so much we must be in the presence of other believers it's it's a wonderful thing to have it's a wonderful gift to partake in to be able to sit around and praise and worship our god together so heavenly father we know this is a um a poor substitute but heavenly father we as we come round your word this morning again like we asked this morning lord we pray that you will just help us that this evening lord that you will just come close to us draw near to us and help us undertake for us as we come round your world word that you will help us to understand it lord that it, you you would open the pages to us make it plain for each and every one of us Oh, Heavenly Father, we pray for that. And Heavenly Father, as we come round uh, this evening together, Lord, we, we have a, a mixed congregation, people from different backgrounds and, and different churches, but Heavenly Father, we have all needs. And Lord, we would just pray, even this evening, Lord, that you will hear our prayers uh, this evening for our families, for our friends, for our churches and for our country. Heavenly Father, hear our supplications, hear our petitions this evening, Lord, as we raise them to you. Oh, Lord, we want you to hear them and answer our prayers. Lord, we want to come expectantly uh, this evening that when we do pray, Lord, that you, we know that you will answer. Because that's the kind of God we serve. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for uh, those people who are in the front lines this evening the, the nurses the care staff the policemen the, the firemen the the, the, um, the retailers uh, 
shops. Heavenly Father, we just pray for these people. We thank you for them, Heavenly Father, and we realise their worth now. Uh, Heavenly Father, maybe if we hadn't these people, what a state this country would be in. Lord, we would just pray and thank you for them. But Lord, we would pray that you would keep your hand upon them and protect them at this time. And then Heavenly Father, if there's any Christians, and we know there will be in those occupations, Lord, we would pray that their witness will, will, will go far. That the people that they work beside will see that they have a real hope, a real eternal hope in Christ. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you will use this time, Heavenly Father, to, to increase your kingdom. And Heavenly Father, we just pray for that. And Heavenly Father, as we come round your word, Lord, again, we just pray that if there's anybody here uh, this evening listening in who does not know Christ as their saviour, oh Lord, we just pray, as we prayed this morning, oh Lord, we pray that they will turn to Christ because it is only him they can turn to. No one else, no other thing, no organisation, nothing but Christ and him alone. So Heavenly Father, that is our prayer this evening. That someone will hear this and turn from their sin and turn to Christ. And we ask these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. As I said, we're going to continue on this evening in our um, series in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I suppose tonight's title would be A Responsive King. A Responsive King. And we're going to look at Ezra again, chapter 1, and the first 11 verses of Ezra, chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you and all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go and to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. <clears throat> and all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. And actually we'll just end <clears throat> excuse me, our reading there at verse 6 in this evening. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so last week uh, we briefly looked at why the nation um, was in exile and I suppose well, we could sum it up the same way we could sum up the reason for their bondage in Egypt and simply put it was their sin it, it was their disobedience to God and God's word and his commands they were living in disobedience. And because of this willful and deliberate rebellion, God says enough is enough. And he sent them back into slavery and back into exile. But God is a gracious God. And by the hand of the prophet Jeremiah, 
he declared that this exile would only last for 70 years. And if they sought him with all their heart, then he would restore the nation once more. He would restore them back to their land. He would restore them back to Jerusalem and he would rebuild the temple at Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to begin this evening. And I want to look at two points of this evening. Point one, a stirred king. And point two, a stirred people. A stirred king and a stirred people. Look again at verse one with me. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of of Cyrus king of Persia so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. King Cyrus was a great king. He was a great pagan king. He ruled Persia and as he did that, as he ruled this great nation, it became a great nation and a great military force. It was a dominant force within the region at that time. His military campaigns brought many nations into his subjection. He ruled at that time the four corners of the world, of the known world at that time. He brought an end to the Babylonian Empire and he himself ruled a great empire. And in fact, you can read in the book of Daniel in, in chapter 2 and, and we see many commentators would identify the chest and the arms that are made of silver in, in the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, they would say that this is a Medo-Persian empire. This was Cyrus's empire. So he's also without a doubt a great warrior. He could devise and complete a campaign. He would have needed to be ruthless. He would need it to be fierce to overcome all these enemies but also he was a shrewd leader let me tell you that when he conquered a land and its peoples he would respect the traditions and the customs of those people that he has just conquered and in many ways this would relieve the tension that, that would and it would bring forth a like a partial harmony between the conquerors and those who had been conquered but also they would recognise the local deity, the god that that population worshipped or the gods, whatever it may be. Usually there was more than one in these pagan lands. But they themselves would not follow these gods. They themselves would not convert to them. They followed their own gods. But they would let the conquered people continue to worship their idols and worship their gods. And this was their strategy. And let me tell you, it's a very clever one. And it's one that worked for them. But as we read these opening verses in Ezra chapter 1, you know, they're not just a list of names or a list of dates. or It's not just an historical record, which, by the way, we can see in the British Museum where we find the Cyrus cylinder, which we can see written on this cylinder how he restored the displaced people that he conquered and how he restored their temples. Yes, it is partially all of these things. It is partially about names, about dates and about an historical record. Of course, it partially is. But I want, what I want to draw your attention to this evening and what I think we must realise what we are reading when we read these few verses in Ezra, the beginning of Ezra, is a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. What we are reading in the pages in front of us was predicted hundreds of years before it actually happened. And the incredible thing is that Cyrus is named in these prophecies. So there's no ambiguity here. There's no vagueness whatsoever. It is crystal clear. You know, and when we read the prophecies that are concerning this time in history, one of the first things we read is that the 70-year exile will come to an end. 
We read of that in the book of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 25, but also in Jeremiah 29 and verse 10, where it says this. For thus says the Lord, this is Jeremiah speaking, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. God will visit them and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. The 70 years, 70 years will end and God promised to bring them back to Jerusalem. And then, as I said, Cyrus himself is named in Scripture. In Isaiah 45 and verse 1, he is called God's anointed one. One that God has set aside to fulfill his will and his purpose, his divine purpose. Cyrus was named in Isaiah 45, but also he was named in Isaiah 44 and uh, verse 28. Now, before I read this, or if you're reading with me, Isaiah 44 and verse 28. Before we read this together, keep this in mind, please. That this was written, this portion of scripture is written approximately 150 years before Cyrus became king. Before Cyrus defeated the Babylonians, Babylonians before he, he sent the nation back to Jerusalem. 150 years. And this is what it says. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Cyrus here would do everything that God told him to do. God would stir Cyrus's heart and his mind. And here God says, Cyrus, would give the command to rebuild Jerusalem. He would give the command to restore the temple. And over a century later, he does exactly that. You know, so often we look at Bible prophecy and we think, what's happening next? Maybe the tragedy of the disaster that we see on television or on the internet, uh, we think, has that got anything to do with God's prophecies? Of the, the prophecies that we read in the Bible. When I search my Bible and I would find something out about those disasters. Or we can think to ourselves, what's the next thing, the big next thing to happen in God's timeline? What is the next great mystery that is going to be revealed to us? Or maybe even at this moment in time, you're thinking, has this pandemic anything to do with prophecies in the Bible? Maybe it has something to do with the book of Revelation. I've heard many people say, not many, but a few, say that maybe it's something to do with Revelation and chapter 6. Well, let me just say this and let me get on the record. I don't believe it is. I believe this is a wake-up call to the church as a shot across our bow. But also let me say this this evening. Bible prophecy validates scripture. What we are reading is the word of God. It is always correct. God's word is always true. Every promise we read of, every prophecy we read of, every judgment we read of has been or will be fulfilled. For hundreds of years, mankind has tried to belittle scripture, to discredit it in any way he can by adding to it or by taking away from it. He's even tried to destroy it, but he's not able to because this is the word of God. Let me tell you this evening, God's word is absolutely trustworthy. Absolutely. In the Old Testament, we read of the first advent of Christ. We read of his birth. We read of his life. We read of his death. We read of his resurrection. Before any of them happened, we read of them. In the Old Testament and throughout Scripture in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we read of a second coming when he will return once more, not as a babe, but as a triumphant king. In the book of Judge, or sorry, the book of Jude, we read of Enoch preaching of the second coming of Christ. And you may say, so what? So what, so what Joe? You may say he wasn't the only one at that time, Joe. 
Others in the New Testament did the same. Peter, Paul, in their letters, we read of the second coming of Christ. Well, let me tell you, Enoch was preaching of the second coming of Christ before Christ came as a babe in a manger. He preached it in the book of Genesis. This is what it says in the book of Jude, in verse 14. It was also about this, these, that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones, his angels, to execute, execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Before the first advent of Christ, before Christ came the first time, Enoch is talking about his second coming. So, you know, when we read of Cyrus and Ezra, we need, it, it really needs to give us great comfort and, re, and reassurance that God is in control. He is sovereign over all things. He's sovereign over the nations. He's sovereign over mankind. He's sovereign over history. And here, as a nation is in exile, God is in control of their situation. And he is in control of Cyrus the king. This pagan king. Now I've heard some people who are uneasy with this fact. That God used a pagan king. Their thinking is in ways simplistic. I don't know if that's the best way or best word to use there. But in a certain way it can be understandable. But I think... Many of them think that God should have used someone else. Someone who was more aligned to God's thinking. Someone who was more in God's wavelength. A follower of the one true God. And many in modern Christianity can think along these lines. Surely God could have raised up Daniel in the exile. Made him a mightier man than he really was or already was. A great warrior. He could have been a great warrior. He could have come before the nation that, that held him in bondage and, and, and came and, and defeated them. Led the nation to victory over this pagan king. He would have been able to bring the, the, the exiles back uh, triumphantly. Bring the nation once more back into their homeland. A bit more Hollywood really isn't it? That's what they're wanting. But God is God. He can use who he wants, in the way he wants, in the time he wants. And it will always glorify him. Can you imagine if it was Daniel that God used? How Daniel would be raised up? How we, we would want to make much more of Daniel? No. God uses Osiris because it gives him all the glory but also at this point turn with me in your bibles uh, to the book of proverbs and proverbs 21 proverbs 21 and verse 1 the king's heart is a stream of water in the hands of the lord he turns it wherever he will relevant when it was first written relevant to king cyrus who we see before us but very relevant to us today as well the leaders that we have today are the leaders that god has given us all these leaders he will use today for his purposes. Doesn't matter what I think of them. Doesn't matter what you think of them. I hear so often many Christians saying that we need to get Christians into parliament. We need to get Christians into the seats of power. Godly men and godly women. And there's nothing wrong with that. No. But sometimes I think their reasoning is wrong. They think that if this happens then things are going to change. That we will become all of a sudden a godly nation. Just let me remind you, God's ways are not our ways. As I said, he will use who he pleases. Back in the book of Ezra, it is Cyrus. He uses a pagan king. 
to get what he wants, to glorify him. Today, he may well use Boris or he may well use Nicola, but he will choose who it is. And he does that because he is sovereign. He is a sovereign God. He's sovereign over the kings. He's sovereign over the nations. He's sovereign over our suffering. My suffering and your suffering. He's sovereign over that. He's sovereign over evangelism. He's sovereign over salvation. He's sovereign over this world. He's sovereign over nature. He's sovereign over me. And he is sovereign over you. As I said this morning, I, I, I worked in the jewellery trade. And um, we, we had a shop and, and we're moving to a bigger shop. And we'd been trying to get this watch brand. It was a brand called Tag Heuer. Now, maybe some of you are aware of it. <clears throat> we'd been to trade fairs, I told you this morning. You know, we'd been to England. We'd been to Switzerland to see them. We'd been uh, over to England to their headquarters to try and, try and smooth them. You know, to see if we could get their brand. We couldn't, but eventually we did. But in the interim, we were introduced to another brand. Another watch brand called Sector Sports Watches. And it was Swiss made and Italian design. That was one of their selling points. And, and, and their tagline was no limits. Sector Sports Watches, no limits. No limits to what you could do with this watch. No limits to where you could go with this watch. It was marketed to the extreme sports fan. You know, those base jumpers, those people you see jumping off high buildings or the edge of cliffs with those silly bat-like costumes on. Or free divers, people who would just jump into the ocean and just keep going down and down and down and seeing how, how deep they could go and for how long they could stay there. Or sometimes it was a Paris to Dakar rally. That kind of thing. And they were trying to say, these watches have no limits. But let me tell you, if you banged your watch, your, your sector sports watch, your off a rock then let me tell you it was limited it broke but this evening God truly has no limits no limits on his power no limits on his rule God is never less left second guessing never he's never at a loss and we see this in the life of King Cyrus God stirred the heart of this pagan king to do his will And that leads us on to our second point this evening. We see a stirred people. A stirred people. Look again at verse 5 with me of Ezra chapter 1. Then rose up the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred up, stirred to go up, to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, uh, uh, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Now I say this reverently this evening. God was doing a lot of stirring that day. As we've just seen, he stirred the king into action to be a responsive king. Responsive to the commands and, and the will of God. And now he is stirring the people to get moving, to build the house of the Lord. God literally shook awake the people to open their eyes. Now, as I said last week, not everyone who could leave and return would do so. Not everyone. And we can see that implied in verse 6. But also, many would have been born in Babylon who were able to go back. They would have not known anything else but life in Babylon. But also remember how I said last week they were to assimilate into the culture. They were to be part of the society that they were now in. To be subversive in their obedience. They were to build homes. They were to, to plant their crops. They were to eat of those crops. They were to pray for the welfare of Babylon. <clears throat> so not everyone wanted to return. Some wanted to and, and probably in their minds had a good reason to stay their life in Babylon would not have been perfect but maybe it would have been and maybe they're thinking look what we're going back to that this 
This land that was ravaged by war, has it been rebuilt since we've been away in exile? There's no temple. Now, I know there wasn't a temple in Babylon at the time, but they're going to have to go back and start to build a temple in Jerusalem. Maybe they're thinking, who's living there now? Is there anybody living? And if there is, would they be friendly to us? Had the, had the land been left unattended since we've been in exile? Would the cross be easily sold? And maybe they're thinking, you know what, we're going to have to start all over again. We, we're, we would have to sacrifice all that we have achieved and built up over the last 70 years in here in Babylon. They've been there and their, their houses, they would have to sacrifice their houses, their land, possibly their, building, their, their businesses and their wealth. But you know, sometimes God calls us to leave behind the comfort and the contentment in, of, of our life. And to move to something that isn't, in our eyes, more attractive. It isn't comfortable. And he does that so he can use us. So often we're, we're called to leave behind things that hinder us. We're called to leave organisations that stop us from fulfilling God's will in our lives. There are many things in our lives that we cling on to that, that seem at this particular moment in time important to us. Associations and activities that we feel we cannot leave, we cannot live without. I know of women who would rather give up God than the Women's Institute. That's true. I, I know men who would rather give up Christ than their football team. Let me ask you this question this evening. If there is anything holding, if there's anything that's holding you back from Christ, is it really worth your eternal soul? I could, I could answer that for you. But really it needs to be you that answers that. You know, membership of an organisation won't save you. Only Christ can save you. But membership of an organisation can damn you to hell. I, I, let me repeat that. A membership of an organisation can damn your soul to hell. You may say, well, well how is that possible? Because you put that organisation before Christ. You've rejected Christ as Lord of your life and you've replaced him with something else, that organisation or association. Let me tell you or ask you, is that organisation or association worth that? Again, <clears throat> you need to answer that yourself. But as I said, God stirs up the heart of the people here to go back to their land, to go back to Jerusalem. And to build the temple. Now this is nearly 50,000 people that will return. These people hadn't had a temple. A place where God would dwell since they had been in uh, Babylon. And many would have been aware of Jeremiah's prophecies. That how one day God would make a way for them to return to Jerusalem. And the day is now. Once more they see that their God is a promise keeping God. He promised he would bring them back and now he is delivering on that promise. The Spirit of God is working in their lives. Now these are primarily the, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin uh, at, at this point. It doesn't mention any of the northern tribes uh, here. None of the ten tribes of the northern kingdom are, are, are mentioned. But in other scriptures, it tells us that followers of God from all the tribes returned to the promised land. 1 Chronicles 9 says this, And some of the people of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim and Manasseh, lived in Jerusalem. But also provision was made for all these returnees by those who remained. They gave help financially to the returning exiles. They give them supplies, they give them money, they give them livestock. All of these things given to help the rebuilding of society, but also to help with the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And again, we can see similarities here with those who left 
um, Egypt in the Exodus under the leadership of Moses. They were also getting financial help from their neighbours so they could go and build the tabernacle. You know, as a, a child of God, when God stirs our hearts to work for him, he will supply all that is needed. Everything that is needed. Here we see it as gold and silver and monies and, and livestock. But when God gives us a work to do today, sometimes the most value, valuable commodity isn't pound, shilling and pence. Sometimes it is people. People. You know, God, sometimes the people whose hearts are stirred by the Spirit of God, whose hearts are alive and on fire for the work of God, are, are worth their weight in gold. You know, many today sit in our churches and leave it for others to do. You'll know people like that. They say, I'll do a work, or I'll start this work when God provides a means. And they never step out in faith. Do you remember years ago, excuse me, <clears throat> do you remember years ago the children's programme Blue Peter? Now you're probably thinking, where's he going to go with this one? But bear with me here. In this particular children's programme, they always had pets. They had dogs, they had cats, and they had tortoises. And every year they would get their tortoises ready to hibernate. And there would be a box and they would fill it with straw or fill it with hay and they would pierce the holes into the box so that the tortoise, when it was placed, would be able to breathe. And, and the tortoise was placed carefully inside of the box. Maybe some of you of a certain age remember this and hopefully you're still with me. Then after a few months live on television, they bring out the boxes and hopefully to awaken the tortoise inside. But here's my point. Many in our churches today are in hibernation. Some have went down into deep hibernation since the lockdown. Nothing has happened in their churches. They're doing very little, if anything. My prayer, my hope is when this lockdown is lifted, that these people that are in these churches, that are in this hibernation, will come alive, that God will stir them, to stir the hearts of these people, will shake them awake. And God will work in these churches for his glory. Many churches are small today. Many churches uh, from the outside look weak. But when God stirs the heart of his people, great things can be done for God. Let me tell you, if, you're, if the Lord has stirred your heart and you need to work somewhere for the Lord, look to your local church. Look to your local church. And if you know me, and maybe you know our church, call me. We have a vision for our church that needs workers. We have a vision for our community that needs workers. We need men and women who are stirred by the Spirit of God to do a work for him. Just like these people in Ezra chapter 1. He stirred their hearts. He shook them awake to open up their eyes, to send them back to build a temple once more. So in conclusion this evening, tonight we have seen how God used a pagan king. He, he used this king, King Cyrus, to do his bidding, to do his will, what he wanted to happen. He stirred his heart. God was in control of the circumstances. The circumstances that the exiles found themselves in. He stirred up their hearts also. There were some 50,000 of them returning. He stirred up their hearts. Some stayed. Some didn't want to give up what they had. They didn't want to sacrifice all that their life had become. They didn't want to take that next step of faith. They were content with what they had. Which really was nothing. Is, is that you tonight? Is there something holding you back? Is there something in your life holding you back? Scripture tells us in Mark chapter 8. 
Mark chapter 8, verse 36. It says these words. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? I want to make something perfectly clear tonight. You will go on living after you die. You will live for all eternity. It could be in heaven. Or you will live in eternity in hell. You will end up in one of those places. If you have all that the world can give you. And do not have Christ. If you have all that these organisations can give you. And you do not have Christ. You are sentenced to hell. Your soul will be lost to hell. Is there anything holding you back this evening? If there is, discard it. If it's an organisation, discard it. If it's a habit, discard it. You know, we pray tonight... That this will be your day of salvation. Your evening of salvation. That you will turn your back on your sin. And you will turn to Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, once more we we give you thanks for, for your help this evening. For your presence this evening. And Heavenly Father, we would just ask that these words, as if they went out, Lord, that you will use them. That is our prayer every Sunday. Lord, as I look at myself, I I realise that these words are so weak so often. that I I don't seem to get the passion I want behind them. I don't seem to get the, the, the phraseology behind them. But Heavenly Father, we know that we've seen tonight that you are in control. You're in control of everything. You're in control of my words and and the words that you've given me. So, Lord, we would just pray this evening as a body of believers that these words will go out and they will penetrate the hearts of the unbeliever. That, Heavenly Father, that they they will realise that they will go on living. That their eternal soul will go on after they die. And it's going to be in one of two places, heaven or hell. Oh, Lord, we just pray this evening if there is anyone out there this evening any family any friends any people we're aware of that do not know Christ Lord we pray we pray together that that you will convict them of their sin that you will show them their sin that you will show them Christ you will give them a fresh vision of Christ and then they will turn from their sin and turn to Christ and know him as their own and personal Saviour. That is our prayer this evening. And we pray these things in our Saviour's name. His worthy name. Amen. Amen. As I said earlier on. Hopefully. Uh, after I go off screen. Uh, there will be two um, items of song. Stay and sing. And uh, meditate upon the words. As I said it's the first one is by the Gettys. The power of the cross. And then the last one is um, Goodness of Jesus, The Goodness of Jesus by City of Light. May you have a blessed evening and may the Lord uh, bless you this week. Uh, And we hope to see you again next Sunday. Amen.
mountain and the woods for through your suffering i am